Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, both in person and now apparently online, uh, to join us for our final press conference of the 240th AAS meeting. Uh, my name is Susanna Kohler. I'm the press officer, and I'm joined here today by Deputy Press Officer Carrie Hensley and AAS Media Fellow Haley Wall, who will be handling, I don't know in which order, but the Q&A session and managing all things in the virtual world. And we're really excited to be here on today. This is the 16th of June, Thursday at just after 10, 15 a.m. And the session we've got for you today is titled Dusty Environments Near and Far. I'm pretty excited about this session because I feel like dust does not get the credit it deserves in astronomy. And it's kind of cool to have a whole session here where we're just talking about dust in its various forms. So. Um, just a note that all of the sessions from previously in this week have been recorded and uploaded to the press kit. You can find them all on our website. You can find them on the YouTube channel. So all the recordings are there already. Also all the press releases from previous sessions and the slide decks from previous presenters. Um, today, we've got a number of press releases. I don't even know how many coming from all of you here. So those will be added to the press kit as well. And yeah, this is our last session of the meeting. So we're gonna make it good. Just a note that we are live streaming this to YouTube. Um, and the way this is gonna work is I will go through and first right now I'll uh, introduce all of our presenters for the day. Uh, then they'll go through and speak in order. And then at the end of that, we'll move into a Q and A session. Uh, if you're watching this online, you can send in your questions via the Q&A box that is in the Zoom window if you're watching this via Zoom, and uh, we'll answer those at the end. Make sure that you identify yourself, your affiliation, and who your question is for. And for those of you watching in the room, you'll be able to ask questions in person when the mic comes to you. Also, please identify yourself, your affiliation, and who your question is for. Okay, so the speakers we have here today are first Christopher Clark from Space Telescope Science Institute, who's gonna be telling us about new images that combine telescopes to reveal the growth and destruction of interstellar dust in nearby galaxies. Then we'll be moving online because we thought it would be fun to add a new technical element. So we're gonna switch back and forth between in-person and online presenters. So we'll be moving online to Arnab Sarkar from University of Kentucky, who will talk about discovery of a pre-merger shockwave in Abel 98, a missing piece in building the most massive structures in our universe. Then we'll come back into the room for Mike Foley from Harvard University, who will talk about building a 3D view of the Orion star forming region. And I have to say, it would have been really cool if we had let him present a live tour in person. However, that was a level of technical challenge I wasn't quite willing to do. So we're gonna stick with a video version of it. Uh, and then we'll move to Jacob Bernal from University of Arizona who's gonna speak on insights into the formation of interstellar fullerenes and carbon nanotubes. And last up, we're gonna have Brian Jackson from Boise State University speaking on dust devils and convective vortices observed by the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and see if we can get things going. Okay, am I audible? Yes, seems I am. Fantastic. So, good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Clark. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. And this work was done alongside all of these wonderful collaborators. Uh, and by combining the data from multiple space telescopes, we've found that the life cycle of interstellar dust and gas is far more dynamic than we previously appreciated, with interstellar dust grains getting violently destroyed very efficiently in some places, but then growing very quickly in other places. Uh, the space between stars is filled with a mixture of interstellar dust and gas. Uh, dust makes up a small fraction of this, normally less than 1%, but it's a really important 1%. Um, dust is made out of small grains of solid material, similar to smoke, and over half of all the starlight ever emitted in the universe has been absorbed by dust grains. Um, almost all star formation happens deep in dense, dusty clouds, obscuring it from easy view. 
and of all the heavy elements floating out in space, like carbon and oxygen, iron, a large fraction of those are locked up in dust grains. So we need to understand dust grains in order to understand galaxies. Otherwise, we're missing a big part of the picture. Our main way of studying dust is by observing its thermal glow, which dust emits in the far infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, here is the large Magellanic Cloud, a small galaxy that orbits the Milky Way, as seen by two different far infrared space telescopes, Herschel on the left and IRAS on the right. For a high resolution view, we can use Herschel. This was a European mission that ended about 10 years ago, and it provides us with fantastic resolution that lets us make out all of the small, compact, dense, dusty features in this galaxy. However, because of the way Herschel worked, it really struggled to detect the diffuse large scale emission from dust in low density environments. Um, smaller space telescopes like IRAS can make out this diffuse emission. However, their resolution is 10 times worse or more than Herschel, meaning they couldn't make out all the small compact dense features that Herschel could see. So we have Herschel missing the low density stuff and small telescopes like IRAS missing the high density stuff. And this is a big problem because we need to understand all these environments together in order to understand the life cycle of dust in galaxies. Uh, to solve this, we use some fancy mathematics to combine the data from multiple space telescopes, Herschel, IRAS, Planck, and COBE, uh, in order to produce images that uh, preserve uh, the diffuse large scale emission and the compact high resolution features. This kind of combining data is commonly done for radio telescopes, but it's really fiddly to do in the far infrared. So it's only been done a couple of times before. So here we have a before and after, and with our new data on the right, hopefully you can see on these screens that there's a lot more diffuse emission you can finally see in the glow around this galaxy, um, about 30% more emission in some cases. And so with this uh, new combined image, images, we can now uh, finally properly compare the dust and gas together in nearby galaxies. So here's a beautiful three color image we've been able to make of the large Magellanic cloud. Uh, the blue shows emission from warmer dust, the cold shows emission from, um, so the green shows emission from colder dust, and the red shows the hydrogen gas in this galaxy, the most abundant gas in the universe, uh, as observed by various ground-based radio telescopes. Uh, we've been able to produce these new combined views for several other nearby galaxies. You can see here, there's the small Magellanic Cloud, the Andromeda Galaxy, and the Triangulum Galaxy. And combined with the large Magellanic Cloud, uh, these are the four largest neighbors of the Milky Way. And these provide a range of environments for us to look at and understand the life cycle of dust in galaxies. Our main finding has been that the ratio of dust to gas in galaxies can vary far more than we previously thought it could. Uh, that's what these maps show. These show the dust to gas ratio in uh, each of these four galaxies. Uh, in the Andromeda galaxy, we find the dust to gas ratio varies by a factor of 10 between the least dense and most dense regions. In the small Magellanic cloud, we find it varies by more than a factor of 20. And this is way more than we were expecting. This tells us that in the densest parts of these galaxies, dust grains are growing very rapidly by accreting heavy elements from the surrounding gas. Then in less dense regions where there's no shelter, those dust grains are getting blasted apart by supernova shock waves and hard radiation very efficiently. And this, uh, this life cycle is far more dynamic than we previously appreciated. We've also found that, um, for instance, the large Magellanic Cloud and the Triangulum Galaxy have very different dust to gas ratios, which is surprising because these galaxies are very similar in almost all regards. So this tells us we still have a lot to learn about what drives the relationship between dust and gas and what drives the life cycles of these materials in interstellar space. And so I'll leave you once again with uh, this fantastic new view we've been able to create, which has helped us to understand uh, what's happening in interstellar space in these galaxies far better than we could before. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Okay, Arnab, if you want to go ahead and share your okay. screen, and we will, let's see, give me just a moment now. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it, I can see it. In a moment, everyone else will be able to see it as well. Okay, are we looking okay on the live stream? Perfect, all right, you're good to go. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Arnold Sharkar, a grad student from University of Kentucky and a pre-doctoral fellow at Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. So at first, I would like to thank AAS for giving me such an opportunity to present our research. 
And I would also like to thank my supervisors, Dr. Yan Yanshu and Scott Randall, uh, for their fantastic guidance and constant support. So today I will talk about our recent discovery of a shockwave in Able 98 Galaxy Cluster. So at first, uh, what are the Galaxy Clusters? So Galaxy Clusters are essentially what their name tells you. They are clusters of galaxies. So hundreds, if not thousands of galaxies uh, that orbit around one another and they are held together by their gravity. So these are like the gravitational giants of our universe and their mass is 10 to the 14 solar masses typically, and that's a lot heavier than our own sun. And because of their huge gravitational potential, they heat up the gas to hundreds of millions of Kelvin uh, in temperature so that it radiates uh, brightly in X-ray. Now, as you can see in this simulation that these galaxy clusters, they form via mergers of smaller clusters at the intersection of uh, this cosmic wave. Now, if you look closely, uh, you see the clusters are banging together and merging. So energetically speaking, these merging events are the most energetic events in our universe since the Big Bang. Okay, so now uh, today I will talk about such a galaxy cluster, Able 98, that we have been studying recently. So if you see my pointer on the screen, so this is actually the Chandra X-ray image of Able 98. And uh, these two separate subclusters are actually part of the Able 98 and which is clearly visible in this X-ray image. And this is an optical image of Able 98. Now, this image is a composite image of Able 98 where uh, X-ray images overlaid the optical image. Now, these two subclusters, uh, each of them has a mass 10 to the power 14 solar masses and they are held together by their own gravity. So now you can imagine that how massive this structure is. Now, these two subclusters are currently falling to one another and to become a one massive cluster, but it would take 2 billion years in future to collision actually take place. So we got these galaxy clusters in a very initial phase in its margin process. Observation of such uh, early state margin galaxy clusters are very rare. Okay, so now these, uh, here I'm showing you the temperature map of Evel 98. Now imagine when you uh, capture an image using a camera, it's each pixel actually tells you that how bright the pixel is. Now in this image, each pixel is a temperature. So the brighter regions are actually the hotter regions. Now, these two circles, they represent the two subclusters that I just show you, showed you earlier. And you see there are complex uh, temperature structures, including arc and rings as well all over the field. But interestingly, we found a arc of hot gas uh, between these two subclusters. And this arc is actually way hotter than those subclusters themselves. Now, computer simulations that predict that the, when two subclusters merge, they actually compress the gas between them and that launches the shockwave that heat up the gas. Now, this arc of hot gas could be an indicator of a shockwave. Now, before we say that the arc uh, is shockwave, now let me show you two images. So the left image is actually an uh, X-ray image of Evel 98. And this right image is a Gaussian gradient magnitude filtered image of this uh, left image. Now, Gaussian gradient is a filtering technique uh, to bring up the sharp features in an image. Now, shock waves are generally associated with a discontinuity in the intensity. So we should see some sharp changes in the intensity in the arc region if the arc indeed a shock wave. Now, zooming in, uh, you see a bit south from this uh, cluster core, there is a arc region, uh, arc shaped region where the, uh, there is a sudden change in the intensity. So this arc is remarkably uh, coincides with the arc of hot gas that we just saw in the temperature map. So this means that this arc is a strong indicator of shockwave, but we need one final test. So before going there, let me tell you that what happens when a shockwave that passes through a gas. Now imagine that this box actually traps the gas between two clusters and these uh, blue balls, these are the gas particle. And this yellow curve here, you see on the left of the box, this is actually a shock wave that is about to travel through the gas. Now, as the, uh, as the shock wave travels through the gas, it actually compresses the gas and heats up the gas. Now you see the left side of the shock, uh, the gas is more compressed and hot than the right side. 
And this makes a discontinuity in the gas pressure. Uh, and the gas pressure is just the multiplication of density and the temperature. So this is the final check. If the arc of hot gas indeed is shock, then the pressure should be discontinuous across it. Okay, now in this figure, I'm showing you the pressure measurement uh, of the gas between these two subclusters. Now this blue curve is this actually shows the, the pressure in the direction as the arrow indicates in this image. Now you see around this arc, the pressure shows a large discontinuity. And this is a classic signature that this arc is actually a shock, shock wave. And this is a Mach 2.2 shock. And given the fact that these two subclusters in Able 98, uh, they will collide roughly 2 billion years in future, our discovery of the shock wave is the first axial shock ever detected in a galaxy cluster in a, such an early stage of its merging process. And this will change the way that we previously thought about the cluster mergers in, in their early uh, stages. stages. Finally, uh, in summary, we caught two clusters in Able 98 uh, in their early stage of merging process, and we detected for the first time an actual shock between them. Now, let's imagine that you are about to watch a movie, uh, a, a crime thriller movie, and where their crime has happened, and uh, there is a detective who will investigate the clues, and at the end, he will catch the criminal. But somehow, you miss the first 20 minutes of the movie. When you, now, when you start watching the movie, the movie has already progressed. So what do you do? You will probably try to guess that what could have happened in those missed 20 minutes by understanding that what is happening now. And you will probably never get the complete picture of the movie. Now, until now that we have several observational data that paint a picture of what happens after the collision of the two galaxy clusters, but we didn't have much observational data for what happens long before the collision. So just like the missing first 20 minutes of the movie. So we have a simulations that predict that we sh what we should observe in, uh, in the early in the margin process, but they are telling different stories. So our observation of Able 98 and the detection of the shockwave give us that mission episode of the cluster margin. So now we have a picture of what this process actually looks like out there in our universe. And now we can complete the picture of the formation of these most massive structures in our universe. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Mike. Hey everyone, my name is, can you hear me all right? Good, okay, great. My name is Michael Foley and I'm a fourth year grad student at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Um, I work with Alyssa Goodman and Lars Hernquist and I'm very excited to be here today to talk about some work we've been doing to build a 3D view of the Orion star forming region. And so what I'm showing here will make a little bit more sense in a few slides, I promise. But this is uh, sort of the stuff I'm talking about. We now can create interactive figures where we can rotate and fly around the Orion star forming region for, for the first time ever to study the 3D locations of stars and other structures um, in, in real time. And so I want to jump back to 2D first um, to orient ourselves a little bit. So on the sky, this is, of course, what the Orion constellation looks like. Um, and I'm showing a few other structures on here. So I've put on um, three colored lines. Those indicate molecular clouds projected on the sky. We can actually fit now 3D spines to molecular clouds, uh, but this is just projected back into 2D. Um, so the green um, corresponds to Orion A, uh, the blue corresponds to Orion B, and the purple corresponds to Orion Lambda. And then the big purple sphere looking thing it's actually a 3D dust shell we were able to fit using these new 3D dust maps that we've been able to implement. Um, and I should say that it took a monumental amount of work uh, from many different teams to get 3D dust mapping to this point. So it's, it's been a real um, exciting journey to, to see this come to fruition. Um, but uh, this 3D model 
um, is huge on, on the plane of the sky. So just to orient ourselves again, um, I'm zooming in to show just a picture of the Orion Nebula. It's just a tiny little patch there. And the Orion Nebula on the sky is about the size of the full moon. Um, so for context here, this, this is massive um, on, on the plane of our sky. Um, so we can um, go a little bit deeper in 2D before we switch over to 3D. So I'm just showing here the, the same structures I just introduced, but I'm throwing on red dots corresponding to a young stellar cluster that we think is crucial to this story that we're going to tell about um, what created that 3D dust shell. And you'll notice that the right kind of smack dab in the center of it, um, and they are coherently expanding outwards from a single point, interestingly enough. Uh, and that single point is that little green dot, right, smack dab in the center of the shell. And so we can add in other 2D observables to extract more information before we go to, to 3D. So we can throw on 2D dust um, from Planck. Uh, that's shown now in green here. And you can see that like our 3D dust uh, shell doesn't really correspond to much in 2D. You really need to go to 3D to, to find these hidden structures. And so it's bringing a lot of new information up. What you might notice though, is there is kind of a big void in the 2D dust. Um, interestingly enough, that does show up also in, in the 3D structures and a little bit more clearly. So I'll show those two main structures in, in our 3D model um, next. And so we're gonna go back to that original movie that I first kind of showed on. So um, we have the molecular clouds around A, B and Lambda shown here, along with the star cluster put in. And all we've done is load on our, this new 3D dust map we're able to use. Um, and I'm rotating it around. Now uh, you can see where that large sort of ring of dust appears. Um, and if you look at it sort of from like a top down view, so imagine you're standing in the galactic plane looking down at Orion, you can see there's sort of like a nice big cavity around those stars. That's, that's where that purple shell falls. And you might notice as well that all of the molecular clouds in the Orion region fall kind of on the edge of that shell, um, which we think is a pretty uh, interesting indication that we might be experiencing what we call triggered star formation in the Orion region, where you have something like a supernova explode, push gas together, and trigger new stellar birth. So we can go back to 2D to try and understand a little bit more, maybe where are supernovae going off? Where are the explosions happening? So what I'm showing here now is the same 2D observables from before, but I've added on aluminum 26, which is a radioactive tracer of supernovae and other, other massive stellar um, events. But uh, primarily here, we're looking at the supernovae. And you can see that it's kind of all throughout the Orion region. Um, there's a nice enhancement right around our star cluster, and it fills out that sort of 2D dust ring quite nicely. So it, it indicates that there was quite a lot of explosive events happening in, the, in this area. Um, and uh, we can also go to other famous structures in the Orion region. Um, so there's a lot going on in this, in this figure, but I'll step through it real quick. Uh, I've added on now H alpha, which is hot gas basically in blue. Uh, and there's a very famous structure in the Orion star forming region known as Barnard's Loop, which is just this giant arc um, in physical size it's about 50 parsecs in radius. It's huge on the plane of the sky. Um, and people have studied it and tried to figure out what caused it for quite some time. Um, it corresponds extremely well with that sort of 3D dust shell that we found. Uh, and it appears that um, supernovae from that young stellar cluster that we identified could have played a major role in the formation of Barnard's Loop uh, based on the spatial coincidence. And you can see also I'm highlighting um, sort of the contours of the aluminum 26, that radioactive supernova tracer, and they all kind of form a nice um, centered picture around that young stellar cluster. We're not saying that young cluster is responsible for all the feedback in Orion, but it certainly looks like it played um, a major role in what we see today. Uh, we can also do amazing other stuff with this new 3D data. So for kind of the first time, we're able to get actual gravitational calculations of the effect of gravity from dense gas and dust on stars in 3D. So for example, we can look down at that cluster of stars that I mentioned, um, and we can calculate the gravitational acceleration from all of that dense material, all that 3D dust 
on um, every one of the stars in the cluster. And we find that um, the gravitational acceleration, as you might expect, is stronger for the stars that are closer to dense gas that's kind of pulling on the stars. And so if this is an expanding shell of material and a clumpy and um, anisotropic one at that, over time, that could introduce anisotropies in the uh, kinematics of this star cluster. And that's actually what we observe. The stars closer to the dense material are traveling about two kilometers per second faster than the stars that are a bit farther from the dense material. We also can ask, when did supernovae go off? So if we have stellar information, um, we can take the properties of a particular star cluster. We can say, okay, how much mass is there? Um, how many massive stars do you expect for a cluster of that mass? When would supernovae tend to go off if you have that much mass and you know a certain number of massive stars? And we can get a statistical estimate for when supernovae might have gone off. And so by going through our, our statistical pipeline, we find that it's, it's pretty likely that you got a supernova within the last you know four or so mega years uh, for or meaning millions of years. Um, and that cluster that we've been talking about in Orion likely produced about one to two supernovae within the last few million years. Um, and so I also wanted to highlight that uh, we're really excited about combining all this 3D data with new 2D data. So we've actually put up um, a preprint of the article on a website called Authoria, which is sort of an open publication site. Uh, it allows you to go and play around with our interactive figures and kind of see and, and comment on stuff too, if you would like. And then uh, it'll be up on the archive and submitted to AppJ uh, soon. But uh, check out the preprint if you're interested. And so just to summarize, oh, first I was, this was the interactivity that we didn't want to risk. <laughs> But uh, if you want, you can go and play around and zoom in and rotate uh, our 3D model of the Orion region yourself. So what can all this tell us about star formation? Um, it can tell us interesting things about physics that we haven't been able to really explore before 3D information, like stars may be dragged by dense material and expanding shells. Um, all of the three famous molecular clouds in the Orion region lie along the edge of a big 3D dust shell, which strongly suggests that the star formation we see in Orion may be triggered um, by other feedback processes like supernovae. We also find that given the abundance of aluminum 26 and these huge dust cavities, you probably needed many supernovae to, to reach the current state of Orion. And then finally, supernovae from that one cluster of stars I identified um, that we call OBP uh, B1 likely played a major role in the formation of, of Barnard's loop and other structures just due to its um, proximity to, to some of the gas. Um, and yeah, with that, um, excited to take questions, but later. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Bernal. I'm a National Science Foundation MPS Ascend postdoctoral fellow. Uh, I thank you for coming here, and I'm uh, really excited to talk about some research I've been doing my collaborators at the University of Arizona, Dr. Tom Zaga and Dr. Lucy Zuris, concerning the formation of interstellar fullerenes and carbon nanotubes. Yeah. The arrows. So interstellar fullerenes. Uh, fullerenes are, you may have refer, heard them referred to as buckyballs or Buckminster fullerene. Uh, these fullerenes are complex organic molecules. So I show you a, a somewhat incomplete table of the interstellar molecules which have been detected. They find new ones every year. 
and a table of the number of atoms that those molecules are made out of, like we're made out of molecules. Uh, you'll notice that most of these molecules have two or three atoms. And as you increase the number of atoms in the molecule, uh, the amount that have been detected trail off very quickly. But C60, C70 buckyballs have 60 carbon atoms, 70 carbon atoms. There's a huge jump in chemical complexity. Um, here's a kind of a picture, a little cartoon diagram of what one would look like. It's a soccer ball essentially made out of carbon, that same kind of structure. You have six membered rings and five membered rings, and it's round. So these buckyballs, when they were found out in space, many people looked for them and they found them in different locations. It's in interstellar space, the space between the stars. There's been a great deal of controversy as to how this molecules form because it's the biggest one we know of. Uh, people have suggested polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so kind of sheets of carbon, like uh, little graphene sheets. You have to break bonds and fold it up and close the cage. And there are 10,000 times as many hydrogen atoms out in space as there are carbon atoms and carbon reacts with hydrogen to form things other than C60. Uh, people have also suggested a different root hydrogen amorphous carbon grains, but lab experiments have shown that uh, these grains don't really form C60 preferentially, they form smaller molecules. So that's the problem. How does these large molecules form out in space where we really don't expect them to do that? Well, our group has investigated a synthetic route using silicon carbide. Now, silicon carbide is illness diatomic, so it only has two atoms in it. And it's a very common component of dust that accumulates around a star as a star lives out its life. We now have the experimental capabilities to closely replicate the conditions out in space. And, uh, the regions around a star that's dying. And so to do that, we need ultra high vacuum environments uh, as high as we can get uh, experimentally. And we also need to be able to heat, uh, heat the sample because these are nuclear shock waves that are going through the dust. So we can use transmission electron microscopes to accomplish this feat. Uh, this picture up in the upper right is a Hitachi Blaze sample holder. And in that holder is a, what's known as a microelectromechanical systems, which is very long, it's pronounced MEMS chip. So this little chip, we can put a sample on, put it in the ultra high vacuum of the microscope and heat things. Um, specifically our experiment, we took silicon carbide, which we know is around a star and we heated it in the microscope. So this is what we found at a thousand degrees Celsius, the silicon carbide transforms. Silicon atoms come out of the crystal and the structure is such that you form, transform it into reduced carbon. So uh, graphene sheets and these sheets will uh, distort into C60 molecules. You see on the right, uh, the buds uh, indicated by white arrows and this uh, inset shows a TEM experiment imaging C60. They are identical in size and morphology. This is a state-of-the-art microscope with the, some of the highest resolution of imaging. But even more interestingly, at 1050 degrees Celsius, just a slight increase in temperature, and over the scale of just a few minutes, those nanobuds grow. These are multi-walled carbon nanotubes. So you can see the different uh, layers here, kind of like an onion. The inset is an image of a multi-walled nanotube, which was imaged in the lab separate from our experiment. And these are several times the size of the C60. Now I should note that these grains, the silicon carbide that you see here, this whole thing is silicon carbide. On the ends, you see the nanotubes. Silicon carbide grains are about half the size of the COVID-19 virus. And these nanotubes are about a 10th size or maybe a 20th the size of the COVID-19 virus. So give you an idea of the scale, just how small these structures are really. Of course, we repeated our experiment because um, we wanted to see if we could replicate our results. And indeed we did an identical experiment. We get nanostructures with the same kind of morphology. These are 
capped tubes, so they're rounded on the ends. They have about four or five layers of carbon, while C6 only has one layer. From our lab experiments, we can conclude a, a pretty picture of interstellar chemistry now. When a star dies, you have these nuclear shock waves which propagate through the dust. The silicon atoms leave naturally the structure of the crystal. You get the formation of carbon sheets. And because the grains have a topography, they're curved, you curve it into buds, you form C60. Upon just slight increased heating and duration, those act as nucleation sites for carbon nanotubes. And the, both C60 and nanotubes have very high radiation stability. So we believe that this can survive for long periods of time out in interstellar space, where you'd expect organic chemistry to be bombarded by uh, cosmic rays, ultraviolet radiation. So I'll leave you with uh, this table before. If the structures that we have imaged are present in the interstellar medium, as we expect, the multi-walled nanotubes we see contain over a thousand atoms. That's more than all the molecules in this table put together. This would represent a massive leap in chemical complexity out in space. And uh, we feel wide reaching implications for uh, many different fields. So this little overview, you should see, we can go from the simplest molecules, diatomic, something that there's a lot of, and when you heat it, we may in fact form the most complex molecules out there. So uh, thank you for your time and your attention. I look forward to answering your questions. I'll do it, yeah, let's keep going. All right, well, the few the proud, right? Thanks for sticking around. Late in the conference, let's see here. Um, my name is Brian Jackson. I'm an associate professor in the physics department at Boise State University. Um, I want to talk to you today uh, about some research that my re uh, group is doing, trying to understand uh, the effects of Martian dust devils on the Martian atmosphere. Uh, as you know, Mars is a very dusty planet and the dust cycle on Mars plays an important role in the climate, the geology, will affect human exploration and affects missions operations. And so dust is this huge uh, driver of change and uh, phenomena on Mars, but we don't understand really where the dust in the atmosphere comes from. You're probably familiar with these uh, quasi-periodic dust storms that occur on Mars. Well, it turns out that um, dust devils may contribute more dust to the dust cycle than those enormous global dust storms. But the truth is we don't know for sure. And so my research group is trying to understand Martian dust devils and the contributions to the dust cycle on Mars using meteorological data from the Mars 2020 Perseverance mission. Um, and if we can make that connection, if we can understand the role of dust devils on Mars, and we can make a strong connection between um, weather phenomena on Mars to weather phenomena that we actually see on the Earth. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, one of the ways that we can understand dust devils is by, the study, by studying them on the Earth. Um, dust devils occur in arid uh, regions on the Earth uh, very frequently. If you've ever been out to the Southwest, you've certainly seen dust devils skidding across the desert floor. Um, and what we do in my research group is actually um, to put instruments on drones and then fly them through active dust devils. And so I just wanted to show you a little taste, give you a little taste of the kinds of experiments that we do. This is on the San Rafael Swell in Utah. Um, and we've just managed to catch a dust devil with our drone in this video, which helped, which did a little earlier. You know, there's our dust devil that we're chasing. Um, as you might expect, these are kind of hard to catch. <laughs> yeah, this is us. I'm pretty excited. Um, so like I said, it's, they're not so easy to catch, but our, our experiments have involved um, putting uh, various sensors on the drone, essentially duct taping it, not essentially, actually duct taping them to the top of the drone and then flying them through these active dust devils. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Twister, this, this experiment is completely motivated by that. I wanna be Bill Paxton and Twister. <laughs> um, so we don't have this kind of instrumentation on Mars exactly. We can't just put it on a drone, um, um, but we do know of, oops, I'll keep going. 
But we do know that dust devils are very active on Mars. And so this is a, a series of images collected by the Perseverance rover showing dust devils slithering across the dusty surface of Mars. Um, if you saw the movie, The Martian, that was one of the things that the Martian actually got right. Dust devils are very common on Mars. Almost any picture you take of the surface during the day, you're gonna see dust devils lofting dust into the atmosphere. And so it's estimates suggest that as much as 75% of the dust in the atmosphere is actually contributed by dust devils. So these can be a huge uh, influence on the climate on Mars. But we don't understand how they work. We don't understand what the conditions are that give rise to dust devils exactly. We don't understand how much dust they are lofting into, into the atmosphere. And so we're really interested in understanding that those effects and what, what role that they're playing in the Martian atmosphere. And so uh, for this particular study, we used meteorological data from the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. Um, Perseverance is an amazing instrument. Um, we are very fortunate that the team has made their data public. And so our research group was able to use it. Um, we use data from what's called the Meta Weather Station. That's a series of, of meteorological instruments, including pressure sensors, temperature sensors, wind sensors, and then a sensor called RDS, which can sense um, insulation, how much sunlight is striking the surface of the rover. And so by combining these different data sets, we can actually understand what dust devils are doing to the atmosphere of Mars. When a dust devil passes near the rover, it will generate um, signals in these meteorological data. Uh, it'll, it will cause a little dip in the pressure. It will cause, of course, the winds to, to whirl around. And if it's what we call a dusty dust devil, we will actually see a signal in the dust, uh, the dust time series as well. Many of the features that blow over the small scale meteorological features that blow over the Mars 2200 river, however, are what we call dustless dust devils or convective vortices. And for previous Mars missions, we didn't actually have a dust sensor. And so we would see uh, meteorological signals of convective vortices passing over the rover, but we didn't always know, we very often didn't know whether they had any dust in them or not. Well, Mars 2020 is changing that story because we actually have this dust sensor on it. So let me show you how we, um, how we make those kinds of observations. This is the dust sensor RDS, um, and it's got uh, a variety of different little sensors on, on top and then looking out along the sides. And essentially these are measuring how much light is striking the surface of that sensor. And so if a dusty dust devil passes over, we'll actually see it register in the data from these, from these sensors. So let me show you what those data look like. So this is what a vortex encounter, a dust devil encounter looks like uh, to Mars 2020's meta uh, system. In the top panel, I have the pressure measurements as a function of time. The blue dots are the actual measured points, and then the orange is our model. And so essentially, if you had very sensitive, if you're standing on the surface of Mars without a spacesuit, you would, you would quickly asphyxiate, okay? <laughs> but if you didn't do that, as a dust devil blew over you, you might feel a very, very, very mild kind of popping of your ears, that same kind of feeling you get when you take off in a plane. That's the dip in the pressure that corresponds to the, the vortex encounter. And then in the bottom panel, you see a little, kind of a little spaghetti strands of, of time series. Those are the measurements of the, the dust sensor. And so depending on how the dust devil strikes uh, the, the rover, some of the sensors will see the shadow of the rover. That's when you get little dips in the spaghetti strands. Some of the sensors will see light scattered from the sun into the sensor. And that's where you get little blips, positive, positive excursions in the spaghetti strands. And so by correlating, these pressure time series, which are very robust way to detect convective vortices with excursions up, up or down in the dust sensor, we can actually see whether a convective vortex is dusty or not. And therefrom, we can estimate the frequency of dust devil occurrence, potentially estimate how much dust they're injecting into the atmosphere and really test what the contribution is that these dust devils, ephemeral as they are, are making to the Martian dust cycle. And so for our study, um, just to give you the quick takeaways, um, we actually saw more than 100 vortex encounters over the course of only about 180 souls or days on Mars. So dust devils at Jezero Crater, where Mars 2020 is, is scooting around looking for signs of life, dust devils are very important there. They happen a lot. But only about a quarter of those vortex encounters actually showed signs of dust lofting. So what this is telling us is maybe dust devils aren't as important as we thought. We don't know for sure. Um, but this is very interesting. And this is the first time that we've really been able to make this estimate. How often is a vortex actually dusty? The dust devils that we encountered on, on Mars 2020 um, range from things that are almost transparent, basically things you, would, you wouldn't even register with your eyes, up to about as, as optically thick as LA is on a smoggy day. Um, we have a lot more really cool videos of drone encounters with dust devils on the Earth. Um, dust devils skidding across the surface of Mars. Um, I put them all up at our website here. 
um, boi.st, Boise State, boi.st slash Mars 2020 Dust Devils. And with that, I'm just going to load one last movie. This is, this is an Ash Devil. We were at a, a field site in, uh, if anyone been to Great Dunes in Colorado, Great Sand Dunes, Colorado? Susanna knows what I'm talking about. We were there a few weeks ago, and while we were out in the dune field, just outside of the park, there was a lightning strike. I mean, really close. Um, it actually caused a little wildfire, um, and as we were leaving the park, we actually drove past the, um, the wildfire burn site, and there was this amazing ash devil just, just slithering over the surface of this burn site. You may even be able to see the edges of this, of this blackened region are still on fire. Um, the, the firefighters are kind of standing there I don't know, waiting to figure out what to do. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, you can see there's the fire right there. It's still burning. Um, so this li had literally just happened. And as we drove past this just enormous dust devil, hundreds of meters into the, or ash devil, hundreds of meters into the air, which just, just picked up all this ash. It was an amazing sight. Dust devils are very cool. That's the message I want you to take away from this. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you so much. I am going to put us up here in gallery view and hopefully we can get, let's see, a wide shot of the stage. Oh, we're still mirroring from previously. Oh, that's okay. Let's stick with that. What does this look like on Zoom, Carrie? Can you see? Okay. So we'll go ahead and move into the Q&A session at this point. So reminder, if you have questions in the room or online, if you're online, you can put them into the Q&A box. And if you're in the room, everybody please remember to identify yourselves and your affiliation and who your question is for. And just a reminder that please leave your masks on if you're asking a question in the room, the microphone is quite sensitive and we'll pick up your question anyway. All right, any questions? Thank you so much for all these wonderful uh, talks and pre press releases. Um, I had, uh, I guess, two questions. But I have one question for uh, Jacob. Um, so the transition from carbon nanosheets to uh, buckyballs to nanotubes, if I understood correctly, they seem to be changes in topology. Um, and so have you studied exactly, exactly how the heat and um, electron flow on these complex molecules carry out these topological changes? So if I understand your question, that how do we how do we understand how the sheets change? Yeah, yes. Because uh, in the transmission electron microscope, we see these changes in real time. We actually have, uh, we can obtain video. Uh, it's, it's difficult at the early stages because C60 is very small. It's less than a nanometer. So like I said, less, less than a hundredth the size of the COVID virus. So it takes, uh, of course, state-of-the-art instrumentation just to see anything at that scale. But the um, also it has to be, we're seeing this in profile, right? So this dust is hanging over a hole uh, in the chip. And so if it was just a like a C60 molecule, which is round, we can't image that without it being attached to something. Otherwise, it's just going to fall right into the column of the microscope and then we see nothing. So it's very difficult to see that transition from the sheet, like you said, to the buds. However, the buds to the nanotubes, we can image and as it's happening because the, the nanotubes are several times larger. Thank you. Also, I realized I forgot to mention, I, this, my name is Romy from SAO. Um, I also, I had, may I ask one more question? <laughs> or, um, sorry, this is a question uh, regarding um, uh, the, the last speaker, Brian. Um, the dust devils, what other kinds of analyses have you been uh, considering uh, doing using the dustiness levels of uh, these vortices? Like, can you study the local um, uh, dust level in a much wider patch of area based on how much is being carried up in the, the vortex and the path it's been following, for example? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, one thing I didn't talk about at all, <laughs> which is a key characteristic of dust devils is the wind. I didn't mention the wind at all. Well, it's because the wind data from Mars 2020 only recently became available. And so the, the next very obvious thing to do is to look at those wind data. And if we can get the optical depths from the dust sensor, 
and combine those with vertical velocities from the wind sensor, then we can estimate directly the dust flux from encounters and then extrapolate from that how much dust is being lofted by dust levels of the population. That's the key thing we really want to know. And um, I think we're really close to being able to do that. Hi, so I have a question for Arnab. I hope I'm pronouncing your name. And can yes. you identify yourself, please? Uh, okay, I am Kala Perkins, and I am with Infinity Education. Um, Arnab? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so with your galaxy cluster uh, convergence, um, does, are you doing anything at all in conjunction with dark matter research or surveys with these colliding galaxy clusters? And is there a way that you can work with any of that? Um, so, um, so the dark matter um, the galaxy cluster, they're pretty massive and they contain um, like they're 85%, more than 85% of their mass is like dark matter. So, but the only way that dark matter um, interacts um, with the visible matter is the, the gravity. So for the merging events, when the two galaxy clusters are collide or in the early stage of merging process, um, we could see some of the ripples uh, in there um, for the visible matter, we could see the ripples. And by, from these ripples, we can have an understanding that how dark matter is actually, um, actually distributed in there or how the dark matter is actually, um, you know, um, separated from the visible matter that we see. And this is the one way that we can do analysis. And the another way is the mass estimation. So we can actually direct, uh, we can actually calculate um, the total mass of a galaxy cluster. And we can also measure um, the visible mass of the galaxy cluster. So from that, we can compare that how much dark matter uh, in there. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Liz Landau with NASA. I had a couple of questions for Jacob. Um, the first one is, um, do any observatories exist that would be able to detect these carbon nanotubes? If not, what kind of future telescope would be able to? And the other thing I was wondering about is that if this is true, you know, does it suggest that like carbon nanotubes were in, incorporated into early Earth or something like that? Thanks. Answer the first part. Of course, the answer is James Webb. <laughs> That's the, I think um, it, it's going to be very difficult, and I think it's going to take a great experimental undertaking just to find the wavelengths, the appropriate wavelengths of these nanotubes, because really the nanotubes are a class of molecules. It took a great amount of effort to detect C60 and the C60 cation, C70, it, but those are single molecules. These nanotubes have variation in the number of walls they have, the length, and that can affect the wavelengths that they absorb or emit radiation at. So I think it's going to be a very complicated matter to attempt to detect these um, in interstellar space through, uh, through observational means. Uh, with regards to your second question, we believe that with the time scales of radiation stability, uh, that perhaps are incorporated into meteoritic materials. Uh, we think this also has implications for the pre-solar grain fields um, uh, and could possibly survive into uh, delivery in the forming solar system. So to answer your question, yes. Um, Grover Schilling, freelance from the Netherlands with a question for Michael. Uh, maybe a bit embarrassing, but I must, must have missed how did you exactly determine the distances to these molecular cloud features? Or are you presenting just a model that might be true? No, that's a great question. So these are true distances to the molecular cloud features. And um, I, I didn't get into too much of the specifics about 3D dust mapping, um, but we've been able to combine sort of the 3D dust maps with existing 2D um, extinction maps. Um, because the molecular clouds are isolated very well in the 2D data. And so by combining or layering the 3D um, dust data on top of the 2D data and looking for correspondence where we've been able to basically unite the two.
Hi. Um, so my question is directed towards Michael as well. So you briefly mentioned towards the end, I guess, that uh, the uh, the supernova shockwave is uh, kind of uh, triggering star formation uh, at the shock, I guess. Um, so I was wondering, like, there is there are all these talks of supernova feedback in galaxy formation where you basically shut off star formation as well by supernova. Uh, so I was wondering as to when do you expect uh, these uh, shock waves to trigger star formation and when would you expect them to shut off star formation? That's a fantastic question. Um, I'm going to say right now, I don't have a concrete answer, but my um, sort of expectation from our work looking at the local ISM is that if you tend to have supernovae in an embedded area that is actively forming stars, it's going to serve to just dissipate that gas and basically shut off the star formation. If you have supernovae going off in maybe a less dense region, it can serve to create dense gas that will then go and form stars. So I do think it's a question of the environment in which you find the supernovae. Thank you. This question is also for Mike from Rick Lovett Freelance. Uh, what were the data sources you used to figure out the 3D maps of dust and gas? That's a great question. Yeah, so for the 3D um, dust maps, one of the major sources you need is the 3D maps of stars. So Gaia in particular, delivering 3D positions for stars has been instrumental there because to get sort of 3D maps of dust, you can look for where certain stars are more um, ex like extincted along the line of sight than other stars. And then you can be like, okay, there must be some dust here at this distance, but not at that distance. But there must be some dust along this line of sight, but not that long, uh, not that line of sight. And with enough stars, like, like you get from Gaia, you can actually construct the statistical kind of 3D map. Um, and then, so for combining our entire model together, we also took the stars from Gaia, where we have 3D positions, and uh, we've been able to correlate some of our 3D information with existing 2D observables. So we'll look for correspondence between like dust and um, neutral hydrogen, for example, where you can get velocities and stuff. So they, maybe not positions too well. If we have time for one more question, I actually have one. Um, I'm Carrie Hensley from the AAS, and my question is for Brian Jackson. So let's say you were put in charge of the next robotic explorer on Mars. What type of craft are you going to choose and what instruments would you put on it to answer all of your dust-related questions? That's a very dangerous question. <laughs> uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I could think about things that I want to see, that would inform our things, but I'm sure that there's lots of really great things people could do. One thing I think we could try to do is uh, instrument a drone. Um, Ingenuity, of course, is, is uh, with landed with Mars 2020, and Ingenuity was, is a tech demo. It's not designed to actually do science, but even so, they're coming up with great ways to do science. So I could imagine taking a, a drone like Ingenuity and actually putting instruments on it as opposed to just the camera, um, and then you could do really great things to study the, the lower atmosphere. Um, that we really just haven't been able to do from 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 the landed spacecraft. So yeah, give me give me a drone with some instruments on it. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> We're gonna talk. All right, great. Well, we are out of time. Those were some great questions. Uh, so let's give our speakers a hand one more time. Thank you so much. And thank you all of you for being here all week. This has been great. Thanks to all of the PIOs who helped prepare all of these press releases. And uh, thanks to USRA as our sponsor. And at this point, the only thing that remains to be said, and we'll wait for this to load here, let's see, okay, is looking forward to having all of you join us, hopefully in person or virtually in Seattle for the next meeting of the American Astronomical Society, the 241st meeting. So see you all there.